Hi everyone, I'm Deanna Rockefeller and I'm on the board of directors for the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts in New York City. Since we're not able to meet in person, we wanted to create this series of conversations so we can continue to connect and also inspire each other with our work. Today, I'm here with Donna Levy, one of our amazing and talented studio member artists. Hi, Donna. Hi. <laughs> and our theme for our conversation today is gonna to be around global connectedness and Donna's perspectives, and we're gonna share a number of her works. So I know that we have not had a chance to meet in person, but we've both walked the, the halls of EFA. And I would love to start just by hearing a little bit about your studio and your experiences there. Um, yeah, I love my studio at EFA. I've been there since 2016. Um, it's been really great to have a designated space where I work. And I just am always very focused when I get there and I get a lot done. And it's a wonderful community. And as an artist, you work like, the way I work is a lot in isolation, so it really is great to know that you even just pass somebody in the hall and have a quick chat, that's great. And it's also um, changed my work um, a lot. So I usually would work in, in video and in my computer a lot, and suddenly having space allowed me to branch out to making video sculptures or, experiment a lot more, which is always amazing. Yeah, that's the fun of being an artist, being able to experience with the, the different mediums and how someone that you meet, maybe even a hallway, can influence you and open up a whole new avenue. Yeah, and just having the physical space is, is great. Well, and one of your latest works um, entitled The Last Man is extremely relevant uh, for where we are right now. So before I show that clip, I wanted to just read um, a quote from Brene Brown's book, Braving the Wilderness. I thought it was particularly poignant in the way she articulated the struggle of isolation, like you mentioned, especially over the last five months, and the ability of art to bring us all together. So she said, art has the power to render sorrow beautiful, make loneliness a shared experience, and transform despair into hope. Only art can take the holler of a returning soldier and turn it into a shared expression and a deep collective experience. Music, like all art, gives pain and our most wrenching emotions, voice, language, and form, so it can be recognized and shared. The magic of the high lonesome sound is the magic of all art the ability to both capture our pain and deliver us from it at the same time. When we hear someone else sing about the jagged edges of heartache or the unspeakable nature of grief, we immediately know that we're not the only ones in pain. The transformative power of art is in the sharing. It's the sharing of art that whispers, you're not alone. Beautiful. More people died there, more people might have lived. So Donna, tell us about The Last Man. Um, yeah, so um, the theme of uh, the world in the aftermath of an apocalypse has been something very central um, in my art practice, this theme of you know, man's vulnerability, the, the struggle between the forces of man versus nature, 
Um, and the reality of the pandemic was kind of a manifestation of some of these ideas. Um, I was working on other projects, but when the um, pandemic started, I really couldn't focus on anything else. Um, so I, I was most fascinated by the pause that was going on on a global level. And I really wanted to go out and document it. But of course, there was the stay at home orders, which made me stay at home. <laughs> so I thought of how can I can I document this without leaving my house and then I thought of webcams and I've always been really interested in these webcams because they kind of give this objective view of the world um, you know it's just a camera that's filming 24 7 it's usually in central places like um, city centers or beaches and some private ones like um, in restaurants and schools um, and they're just streaming online and even though the world was, was at pause, these, these webcams kept streaming. So I started to collect, started to record the screen of these, um, of these webcams because um, they only, they're only live streaming so you can't really go back and forth, you just have to wait for the, the right moment. So I would, I would grab the screens I would do like screen grabs of these um, of this footage, and and it's very you know it gives all the information there the the, the time, the hour, the place where it, where it is. So all of these webcams have this like information that's running across, which I really like because it tells this is a, something that happened in a very specific time. Um, and after, you know, so I would wake up sometimes in the middle of the night just so I could get footage from like Italy or Europe and or the Far East, you know, there's like Japan, Athens, California, it really was on a global level. Um, and I really liked when there was like one person walking across the screen and it almost felt like this was the last man on earth walking through. So I kind of tried to create this narrative. Um, and then I Googled the words The Last Man on Earth, and that's when I came across this film from 1964, this sci-fi film, it's one of the first sci-fi films um, starring Vincent Price. And there, there was a lot of parallels with this pandemic. Like he was, um, there were people, but he was afraid that they were infected. And you can't touch people because you're afraid that they're infected. And even though somebody looks healthy, like they might not be, they might be in the film that they might be a vampire. Um, and interestingly, that film was also shot in Rome. And a lot of the footage I, I used is from Rome as well. Um, so it was like this strange reality where fiction, so I, I mix these two footages. I mix the very straightforward, um, documenting kind of footage of uh, these places and then the sci-fi film and kind of blurred these two realities like you know where you don't know anymore what's happened last week and what happened um, in this fictional film. Yeah the the similarities were eerie I mean yeah. really like in the in the full work it, it was absolutely incredible. Yeah, there's even a point where he says, I have immunity, I have the antibodies because I was bitten by a bat. And so the, the, the source is also like bats, like in this pandemic. I mean, just a lot of, and he's walking. So these in the film, they, they, he walks around the empty cities because these vampires, they only wake up at night. So he's alone in the world as well. So it was really, it helped me. It really helps me get through this time, just focusing on that. And, and speaking of past and present and kind of that dualism of linking this film from the 60s to 2020, um, in an interview, you talked about this dualism and, and you talked about the dualism in your work as well. And you said, there's something whole, something broken, something wild, something tamed, nature and man, life and death. And I'm curious what role that dualism played in your work, um, history lessons that I'm gonna show here. Yeah. So yeah, what we're seeing is a, um, 
50 inch um, LCD screen and on it are mounted 77 magic lantern slides. So this, um, and I'll speak of, uh, we'll, we'll watch a little clip of how it actually works. So it's a physical object. It's like a sculpture that is the size of a 50 inch monitor and it has these, these uh, antique slides mounted on them. So I think this dualism is, um, is the nature and, and technology, because we have here two different technologies. One is started in the, you know, the 17th century. They, they had these slides, they were hand illustrated. You would light them up with a candle and then the invention of photography came and they were the most popular at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century when, when the um, second industrial revolution happened. And then we have the digital video that's playing. So when we see the video, you'll see that, that the video is playing um, lightning and the lightning lights up these slides because if you just look at the slides, you won't see anything until they're backlit. Um, so I was really interested in, in the materiality, how we went from one format, one technology to another form, another technology and in this, in this century, between these two technologies, like what had to happen in the world for us to go from one technology to another, like a lot, like culturally, landscapes, environmentally, like how these two, um, how these two technologies, the bridge between them, um, what this transformation that happened, how that transformed the world actually, because you see in the images, um, yeah, can you play the video maybe? Sure. Yeah, let's look at this for a little bit. So it's like a living archive. So sometimes the lightning lights it all up and sometimes it lights up um, parts of it. Like sometimes it lights up only women or only trees or only animals. So it's like this living archive that is being lit up by the lightning um, that's being played in the background. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can't really, see, you have to, I mean, it's not the best documentation. It's more like a physical object you have to um, see. But the slides are of different um, indigenous people. They're of uh, cotton pickers, of mining, of timber, all kinds of ways that, um, things that don't really exist anymore in, in, the, in the reality we live in. So they're, they're kind of like flashes from, from, a, from a, a past. I call it like um, awakening from a colonial amnesia because for, these, for the flat inch LCD screen to exist, like what happened culturally during that time. Yeah, here we can see some of these slides. So um, I used, um, the slides are from either Israel, uh, either Palestine or the Americas. So I, I chose these two places. Well, first of all, I'm Israeli living in America, but also these two places have completely transformed um, in this um, period of time. It's not like Europe that was very built. And, and I mean, there were places in, in Palestine that were built, but the majority was not. And suddenly this whole um, technological, cultural revolution happened here. And now these are centers of high tech. Um, yeah. So here we can see some of the slides and these slides are were used for educational reasons and they were very staged. They, they pretended to be like this objective uh, documentations, but of course they were taken mostly by white men with a very colonial, colonial um, agenda. Um, so it's not objective at all. It's a very, um, it's a very staged set pretending to be a, 
vision of the world. And it's interesting now looking back how you can see how clear it is that it, it was one person's vision. I think that's why it's so beautiful the way you put them all together on the screen. Yeah. You have so many different perspectives right there in one section. Yeah, I mean, I was very interested in this, um, the, the materiality as well. Like, for instance, I found out that to make these slides, you use this emulsion that is no longer legal because it's so toxic. And to make a, a TV, like um, all these uh, minerals and mining and colonialism needed to happen just to make a, a TV even happen. So it's really, I was really interested in, in these technologies and the materiality that is behind them and what effects it actually had in the physical world. When, and continuing with the theme of past and present, I want to, um, to go to one of my very personal favorite works of yours. It's <laughs> called This Was Home. And it is, to me, one of the most moving pieces that I've ever seen. And I would love for you just uh, to share why you decided to do it and why you took this um, multi-generational approach um, to the piece. Yeah, so in this piece, um, we have three, the, the, the screen is divided into three, and it's three generations in my family, um, each going back for the first time to their childhood home. So it's my maternal grandfather, my father, and me, and we all left our, the place we grew up suddenly, and we never went back as adults. And this is, in this film, it's the first time all three of us go back to our childhood home. Um, and what, what brought me to make it, I was just thinking how, you know, I, I kind of am the kind of person that feels at home everywhere, but also nowhere. And it's because I've been, you know, since I was two years old, I was uprooted from one place. We moved from, I was born in Israel, we moved to America, and I lived in Europe for years as well. So I've been moving around like three continents. And then I thought about it and I thought it's not just me, it's actually this whole notion of the wandering Jew goes back centuries and it's very prominent in my family as well. Like, I would almost say my family history is, it's very representative of Jewish history. So, um, so at first I filmed my grandfather, he, you know, he left so in this film, we go back to Sosnovich in Poland, and he never really wanted to talk about it. He, he, he just like put it behind him. After the Holocaust, he moved to Germany and became a businessman there and like removed his tattoo and never wanted to talk about it. And I had always wanted to go back with him. And then one day I was just on a road trip in Poland and I called him and he got on a plane and came. And so this is this one day. And he remembered everything, like addresses, names. He was like, oh, Majerovsky. <laughs> like, he, he, he wasn't that impressed. I was like very uh, excited. He, he wasn't even that excited about it. Um, so that started it. And from there, he left, you know, he left when, in 1939, the Germans invaded Poland. And that's around that time he went to Auschwitz from that place. So he lived a very, home, happy life, and then he left. And this was the first time, and then after the war, he ended up in, in Germany, and this was the first time he had been back to Poland since he was a teenager. Um, and then the second one was my father. He left Egypt um, in the 50s after, you know, after Israel was established. Um, it became increasingly hostile for Jews to be in Egypt. Um, after like, I don't know, my, hundred, my family goes back like 800 years at least, like the family tree in Egypt. So we were there for a while. <laughs> and then they left from there to Israel. And this was also the first time he had went back. Like, as if he left when he was 12. And here he is back in his home that's like occupied by like eight kind of homeless people living there. Um, 
And then there's me who left, um, who grew up in Georgia and I left when I was 10 and then I went back um, 25 years later. So, and for me, it was a very positive experience. It was the same person that sold the house, to, that, that bought the house from my parents, the same guy living there 25 years later. And, you know, he was very welcoming. And, you know, in, in my, grand, my grandfather's experience and my father's experience, it was this hostility that they didn't really, they knew exactly who they were and they didn't want really to, to show them because they were afraid that they might claim the house. Um, but the, the, I want to just say that the, the video itself starts with this, um, my, my parents had always told me that we were on 60 minutes when I was a kid, <laughs> and I never believed them, and I finally found it in the archives of 60 minutes, and Mike Wall is, is giving an introduction, and he's saying the first Jewish exodus was Jews living in Egypt, the second Jewish exodus was when they Jews leaving Europe, and the third Jewish exodus is Jews leaving Israel and coming to America. And I was like, oh, that just is <laughs> my whole family right there. So it starts with footage from that um, 60 Minutes episode where my parents are interviewed and stuff. Um, yeah, we can watch a little clip. Yeah, I'll show the clip, but the, the full piece, I will encourage all of our watchers to see the whole piece because it is, it is truly beautiful. But I'm just gonna share the clip now. The left side is my grandfather, the middle is my father, and on the right is footage from Atlanta, Georgia. So in this work, there's constantly these three screens um, and you always hear sound from only one of the screens, but you constantly see, and there's a lot of parallels, like sometimes here we see three people dancing in three different cultures, which I filmed in those three places, and then here there's um, three synagogues, so on the left, there's no remaining synagogues actually in Sosnovich, so this is all the photographs. Here my father in the middle is in Egypt, in Cairo, in the, in the synagogue where his brother got married. And then on the right is me in a synagogue where we used to go to uh, well in Georgia. My father is here, he's recalling his time. Uh, in his brother's wedding where he didn't want to he didn't want to be like a he, he gave himself a bad haircut because he didn't want to wear something he rem he's just remembering exactly the memories he had you know and he and probably when he was like 10 and all three of us are looking for our school so I my father finds his school my grandfather is looking for his school, and then I go back to my school. Um, so it's all three of us in our old schools. And it's amazing, because like, it's such a, you know, this, my father's talking about the time where he was 10, and I'm talking about the time when I was 10 as well, and my grandfather as well, so. Um, yeah, I guess that's the end of that clip. Um, yeah, this was a very personal, one of my, maybe my only extremely personal films, and it took me a long time to understand how I wanted to present it, and it's similar as in history lessons where there's this grid, and I kind of organize this grid, like in history lessons, the lightning sometimes lights up, um, you know, according to different keywords. So sometimes just trees, sometimes just flowers, sometimes um, Palestinian images, sometimes, and it's kind of this order. And here as well, there's like, I put the world in order, like three generations, each one on this grid. Yeah. All going through different or similar experiences at different times in history. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Well, I've so enjoyed talking today and thank you for sharing your, your work, inspiring us, um, sharing your perspectives. And for anyone who wants to uh, see more of Donna's work, you can um, see her at DonnaLevy.net or her handle is Donna Levy Studio. Yeah, but spell like Dana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, spell out D-A-N-A. So thank you, and um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for everyone watching. Stay safe and healthy, and we look forward to seeing everyone again in person sometime soon. Thank you.